This lecture today is in memory of Dr. Harold Rubes, who was Dr. Crouch's professor and also, I was very fortunate to say, also mine. Dr. Rood was the W.M. Keck Foundation Chair of International Strategic Studies at Claremont Graduate School. Dr. Rood was a superb teacher. He was recognized uh, by many who followed in his steps uh, and took positions in public service. To honor Dr. Rood, a few of his former students decided to organize a memorial lecture series over the next three years. And stops on this include here, the Heritage Foundation, Claremont uh, Institute in Claremont, California, Hillsdale College, and Ashbrook Center of Ashland University. The person who's primarily responsible for making this all happen is Dr. Patrick Garrity, who was one of Dr. Rood's uh, finest students and thus one of his humblest. I have the privilege today to introduce our speaker, Dr. J.D. Crouch, who is president of the Technology Solutions Group of Kinetic North America. Prior to his work at Kinetic, Dr. Crouch served President George W. Bush's in President George W. Bush's administration, first as ambassador to Romania, and later as assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor. Dr. Crouch has also held security and advisory positions in the administration of George H. W. Bush, W., and Ronald Reagan, from 1993 to 2001, and later from 2003 to 2004, he was associate professor of defense and strategic studies at Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri. Dr. Crouch holds a PhD, MA, and BA in international relations from the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J.D. Crouch. Great, thank you very much, Colleen. So, can you hear me? Good, good. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, to begin this, the second of a series of lectures in honor of, of Professor Rood. Uh, I, you know, when we first conceived of the idea of doing this lecture series, uh, you know, obviously you could say, well, something done about a particular person, particularly since none of you had, I think, had an opportunity to meet Dr. Rood. You, you know, why are we doing this? Well. This is a man who had an enormous influence on not only a cadre of students, but I think indirectly uh, the way those students then operated in the real world vis-a-vis -vis the international challenges that the United States faced for the last 40 years. This group here is a group of people who will face those challenges soon. Uh, as you graduate, as you go on, as you take commissions, you take positions in government, and the like. And so the idea of the project was not only to do something in the memory of Dr. Rood, which in and of itself is a good thing, but also to begin to expand his thinking uh, and to explain the way he viewed the world uh, to others. Because we, his students, believe it has an important and practical impact in, in, in the way our country uh, faces the challenges that it will face. I want to begin, first of all, by thanking uh, the Ryan Center for supporting this and for, for bringing me out here, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and all of you in particular for coming. And, and Professor uh, Sheehan, thank you very much for what you do here uh, with all of your students. I know that you're, you're well regarded here. And uh, I also uh, want to point out that there are a couple of other folks here uh, who have studied with, with uh, Professor Root. Uh, Dr. Steve Cambone, who was uh, lastly Undersecretary of Intelligence uh, in the Bush administration, uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Bush administration, as well as numerous other things. Uh, Professor Bill Allen was a colleague of Professor Root's at Claremont McKenna College, uh, and is uh, uh, also, also known as the PhD father of uh, Professor Sheehan. Uh, as well as many other uh, uh, brilliant scholars. And I would also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Brenda for uh, helping set all this up. I know that you were the one who, who did all the organizational stuff, and, and I appreciate that. 
So again, uh, let me um, let me begin by talking uh, a little bit about this. I think Pat Garrity has already been mentioned as one of the persons who is a brainchild of this, as well as another student who teaches down at the Marine Corps Command and General Staff College, one of Rude's students, named Dr. Chris Harmon. Many of you get an opportunity to work with him. He's probably one of the foremost experts on terrorism in the world today, if not the foremost expert. Uh, I intend to talk a little bit about Dr. Root's teachings. Uh, this is a great honor for me. Uh, there are many others, I think, who are probably more deserving than, than I am uh, of, of, of that honor. Uh, but they sort of, you know, nudged me in this direction. And none more than, than Professor Garrity, who was mentioned uh, earlier. And he helped me greatly in, in putting together the material for the lecture. And uh, as, as I think was mentioned earlier, I, my day job is, is running a 500-person company. And uh, those people keep me really busy, so, uh, so I, I appreciate the, the work. And we will have a series of lectures at the various places that colleague mentioned. Uh, and each lecture is going to contain some common material that I'm going to talk about today. And each lecture is also going to develop independently some of the themes that Dr. Rood had, both as a teacher and as a scholar of international relations. And we hope then, at the end of all this, to publish this in a fuller monograph that should be available for you, for those of you who are, who are interested in the topic. Now, one of the things that was fascinating about Dr. Rood's approach and, um, is that he, he had a way of enlarging problems. There's a tendency in international relations to look very specifically at certain things. What's going on in Benghazi? What happened there? What is that, you know? Who knew what, who knew, who knew, and who knew it when? As opposed to step back from events in international relations and ask the question, uh, why? Who's benefiting? What is their strategy at work in all of this? And so the sub-theme to this title today is something that he might have said, Nothing happens for no good reason. Now, of course things happen for no good reason. We know that happens in the day to day, right? I mean, you know, you ride along on your bicycle and you hit a stone and you fall over. That didn't happen for any good reason. Nothing happens for no good reason is a way of thinking about international politics. It's a way of examining, is there strategy at work in the world? You know, it was Churchill who said, sooner or later, no matter how good the general, he has to take into account the strategy of the enemy. Right? Well, that's what we have to do. We have to understand if strategy is at work in the world. Now, I think this came probably from Dr. Root's background. You know, he grew, he was born in Seattle in 1922. He grew up in, uh, near the Mar Island Naval Yard. His father was in the Navy. Uh, his father uh, also worked for the Navy afterwards. Uh, he entered the Army uh, enlisting uh, in the Reserve Army uh, Corps in September of 1942. And uh, he was called to active duty in March of 1943. Some of you might remember there were some hostilities going on at that time. Uh, he, he, he was trained as a coastal artillery gunner. He then became a heavy machine gunner and radio operator in the 7th Army and was then deployed as a forward artillery observer in Patton's Third Army in Europe, which you may remember was also involved in, in, in some of the unpleasantness uh, in Europe. And he rose to the vaulted rank of private first class. <laughs> and he was extremely proud of that fact. Uh, he went on, the, the Army, uh, as, is, as, as it's a good thing, the Army went on to buy him an education and he, uh, he uh, went to Stanford, Oxford, Berkeley, the London School of Economics, did a PhD at Cal, in which he wrote a dissertation that I commend to you today called American Preparations for War, 1918-1940. A very interesting document when we look back on it. And as, and as Colleen said, he then picked up as a teacher uh, at Claremont McKenna College and, and was the Keck chair there really until he retired uh, and, and passed away last year. So I remember my first time I met with him. People here remember, anybody here studied the Cuban Missile Crisis? 
No? Anybody, everybody, anybody heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Okay, you know, I gotta, gotta tell it's hard these days. Okay. Now that happened way back then, back in, in, in the early 1960s, but I, I was studying strategic studies at the time. Uh, I was studying with one of the foremost experts on nuclear policy in, in the United States. Um, and you know, I go to this lecture and I'm thinking, I know something about this. You know, sometimes you go to a lecture and you don't have a clue what's going on. I thought, I, I really know something about this, so this is going to be interesting. I'm going to be able to participate. I'm going to be able to challenge him. Within about 30 minutes of an hour and a half presentation, Professor Rood completely destroyed my entire framework for thinking about that problem. And he did it not with bold assertions, uh, but with simple facts that were dripped, kind of like Chinese water torture, onto my forehead. He started asking questions like, why did the Russians not take any, uh, any efforts to mask the movement of missiles into Cuba? If they were really trying to pull one over on us, why did they do that? Why did they make it so clear that they actually set up air defense networks in such a way that it was obvious that they were being designed to protect missiles in Cuba? Maybe they wanted us to know there were missiles in Cuba. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that story. I think it's well worth you looking at the chapter in his book, Kingdoms of the Blind, on that subject. Because while it is ancient history, it's instructive of the fact that what Dr. Rood did was take the standard narratives of the day, the standard narrative of the Cuban Missile Crisis is, Khrushchev was trying to surreptitiously put missiles into Cuba to fool the United States. He was caught by the young American president, John Kennedy, who backed him down and made the missiles come out. Root has a very different take on it. And it is that different take which was a way, that, which began to cultivate in me a way of thinking about what's going on in the world how things may not be as they are told to you in the newspapers. You notice sometimes when you read something, has anybody here ever had an experience in their life where they knew what was really going on, but then they read about it in the newspaper, and the newspaper kind of got it wrong? Has anybody had that experience? Maybe you're too young yet to have had those experiences. You don't have that many of them, right? Because you, you're not, part, hopefully you're not part of the news every day. But it's a little bit like that. That somehow somebody has constructed a narrative around an international problem that isn't quite right. It isn't quite right. So the impact of this on me, sitting through this, was I wanted more. I began challenging everything I knew. You know, nothing was sacred anymore. Uh, and that, by the way, is enormously frustrating, but it can be uh, very valuable to your education. Uh, you know, one of the things Dr. Rood tended to do is, you know, rather than, you know, he didn't have access to highly classified intelligence. What he was able to glean from a stack of newspaper clippings was the most amazing thing you'd ever seen. And he would just walk you through the clippings and make it very clear that, you know, if you're read widely, you can figure things out on your own. And that really was the central teaching. You need to figure things out on your own. You can't rely on others to do it for you. You have to prove it to yourself. It may be that the conventional wisdom, the conventional narrative is right. But try to convince yourself of it. Don't take it and accept it. Why? Well. In your profession, many of you here, because people could die if you make the wrong choice. That's a pretty important reason. And, and it is certainly true uh, for other international uh, uh, problems. So Dr. Root had a view on what happened in Cuba in 1962, but what he cared more about was that his students develop their own views on international politics. 
in, you know, in academic terms, long before it was fashionable, he was a deconstructionist par excellence. He would deconstruct arguments in a way that was firmly grounded in reality, and he demanded that his students do the same. So self-discovery and independent thought are what he cherished most. And in international politics, he used to ask a number of questions. One of them was what I call, uh, you know, cui bono. Who, who is benefiting from this, right? If something's happening, who's the big beneficiary? One of the things he often discovered or, or was, was able to illuminate was that while people may be acting on the ground in one place, the real beneficiaries may be another country or another group of people. Right? So when we look at Benghazi, for example, we ask, you know, who really benefited from this? Who's the, who are the, uh, who are the entities or groups or countries that might take advantage of this? He also looked for anomalies in international relations. What, what are the things that, that stick out? Uh, anybody heard of, did anybody know that the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968? Has anybody heard of that? All right. Does anybody know why? Okay. Well, ostensibly, the reason was because there was something going on in the Prague, in Prague called the Prague Spring, an uprising, and they they intervened uh, to put down this uprising. So it was a defensive operation, right? Well, Dr. Rude noticed that at the end of this, there were five Soviet divisions, two armored divisions and three motorized rifle divisions that ended up not being positioned around Prague, but being positioned on NATO's southern flank of its central, central region. A huge problem for the US Army, which was stationed across the border from them. Well, if you had just moved five divisions into a country like that, how would the Army have reacted? They would have said, oh, this, is, this, is, this is serious stuff. This is dangerous. What are the Russians up to? But since it was in reaction to the Prague Spring, maybe it was a cover for that. Those are the kinds of anomalies that he asked us to look at. But more importantly, he looked for the patterns in international relations. He sought to look at the great problems in international relations. He was particularly interested in instructing his students in what he would refer to, I think, as the hard logic of power, especially as that logic played out in international politics. And he sought to dispel the comforting illusions that, that often plague democracies and Western intellectuals on that score as they confronted a totalitarian or even a regime and, and its ideological, uh, ideological defenders. So one of the things that uh, uh, he was rather dramatic about, I, I don't think you can do this anymore because you, you know, we probably are operating on a gun-free campus. But maybe you guys can, I don't know. But he would bring in, um, he'd bring in an M1. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he, he would bring, and, and, and demonstrate to the students, how do you fix a bayonet on an M1? And what is the purpose of a bayonet? Uh, and, and why is it important to understand those things if you're going to understand what's going on in international relations? Why is it important? to know how things work, right? Uh, in my field, international politics, there's a lot of theory out there. And, and theory is good. But sometimes it is disconnected from the way things work, right? That, that, that we are, in fact, bounded not only by the human condition, but also by physics, or at least our understanding of it. He was very good at that. Um, you know, he was a charming teacher in many ways, uh, and and his uh, ability, you know, for example, one of the things that I think frustrated people is he never used textbooks. Because textbooks were not where you learned things, they were where other people distilled what they had learned about things. He never subscribed to a theory, he focused his students on history, 
as the meat to understand patterns in international politics. And he pointed to the public prints, to newspapers, to periodicals that were publishing day-to-day -day events as what you needed to fit the pieces together into understanding these perennial patterns uh, in international politics. Uh, you know, so for him, the classroom was a crucible for his ideas about international relations. And he was, uh, he pushed his ideas into the classroom, I think further than most, that, that further as a scholar, and he used the classroom to test those ideas, to work out problems, and to challenge students. He insisted that we understand the world around us before purporting to explain it. And in an academy that was filled with a lot of international relations theorizing, this was very refreshing, to say the least, as a student. Uh, his relentless way of challenging the conventional wisdom and advancing uh, alternative explanations to what the experts held to be, to be true produced not only a corpus of original writing, but more important, a cadre of students who were trained to think independently of fashionable ideas. And I think uh, as, a, as a way of thinking about how you approach your disciplines, it's a valuable, valuable one. Uh, Dr. Roos teaching, in fact, exemplified what another professor of mine used to say as an education is what you have after you've forgotten all the facts. How you apply yourself to the facts of the day is what really matters. So let me turn now to discussing a little bit of his approach. So I mentioned that Rude never referred to theory. He rarely assigned readings from theoretical texts. Uh, yet he certainly had a coherent view of the world that he studied. He believed that political events did not occur at random, that they were driven by an inherent logic that strategic matters, in particular, have a discernible logic as they are driven by nation states impelled to organize a chaotic international system in the way that suits them. And indeed, if there's sort of one broad swath of, from ancient times forward, it's his view that it is, it is the, the pursuit of the organization of that chaotic system that it is the kind of the grand theme in international politics. Political events, and I'm quoting, do not as a rule occur at random, but follow orderly progression from cause to consequence. That is because politics is the province of human action, and the instruments of politics reflect the inner logic of human reasoning. <clears throat> Strategy and war, he said, deal with physical objects and material events in time and space. And the physical universe has its own inherent and immutable logic that is subject neither to human preference nor to sentiment. So not everybody grasps what's going on with the same understanding. Not all act logically. Some may act on preference or on sentiment. But in the grand sweep of things, he said, don't look at events as a series of random actions. You know, it's the question of, you know, a few weeks ago we thought in Libya that somebody organized a demonstration because of a video cartoon. Now we know that strategy was at work, at least the strategy of Al-Qaeda. Interestingly enough, he seldom cited great men or attributed the uh, changes in history to great men. Great men are interesting in the study of international politics insofar as they have the capacity to understand the patterns of events that shape the world and use that understanding to shape the world through strategy themselves. You know, men are seeking control and order in a disordered international system and understanding what they're trying to accomplish and how they're doing it is the essence of understanding strategy and of developing your own strategy for your country. 
So, you know, Root's teachings about politics were really hard. They were not hard to grasp. They were hard to accept. Let me, let me quote one of his more famous quotes. Politics is the organization and application of power for the accomplishment of purposes of the political community. Power is the capability to alter, move, or destroy physical objects in the universe. Where human beings are the object of the application of power, power includes the ability to inflict pain to injure and kill, and therefore to govern, influence, and coerce human beings. Politics deals in conflict and the resolution of conflict. That's kind of tough stuff. Now, maybe not so tough for folks in ROTC, I don't know. Because you live with that whole set of problems right in front of you. But for, you know, maybe when you go home and talk to your moms and dads and your sisters and brothers about what's going on in the world, that would be viewed as pretty tough stuff. But unlike so many realists, hard realists, he was never indifferent to the outcome of the, uh, uh, the outcome and its impact on our country. While he certainly believed that the strong will do what they will, while the weak will do what they must. This was not a sufficient guide to him for a strategy for a democratic state. He believed that if the good wanted to protect the weak, they needed to be strong. And so it was important that we got our strategy right, that we developed our means and capabilities sufficient to be in the position to protect the weak. He certainly believed that war is an inherent feature of international politics. Th this is a, a very controversial question. <clears throat> now, if you were to say to yourself, uh, is it likely that we have fought the last war we will ever fight? How many people would raise their hands on that one? I hadn't imagined very many would. But is war really an inherent feature of our system? It's not a pathology. We have treated it often as a pathology. Uh, and it, but it matters who wins. A bedrock certainty for him was that some kind of war was coming in the future. No distinction, in a sense, between wartime and peacetime. You know, I don't, I don't know who said it, but Dr. Root might have agreed that, you know, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading, you know. Um, <laughs> that, they're saying that, that there, there will be a conflict and, and we will have to deal with it in the future. And winners and losers are important because winners organize the peace. And losers are subject to the peace. So one of the most enduring features of international politics, what are the most enduring features of international politics from his standpoint? And he really had a, a framework for how he looked at things. The first thing was human nature and interaction. You, war is fundamentally, and strategy is fundamentally, a human topic. You can't write humans out of the equation. You, 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 know, you can't use simple game theory to understand what's going on in the world. You also had an, another important element of this is the properties of physical, doing physical work. How, you have to understand how things happen, how physical work is done. You know, in, in, in your world, you can imagine sending an army brigade to Iraq. But it's really hard to describe what all has to happen to get that army brigade to Iraq, to get it sustained, to get it resupplied, uh, and to get it home. Uh, so what are the properties of physical work, and how do they affect and limit your options in terms of strategy? Third, there was geography. Geography is sort of 
immutable. Now, technology changes geography in a sense that technology can allow you to fly over mountains than rather than drive around them. But you still have to deal with the impact of geography. And so understanding a little bit about the geography of the country you're operating in, including your own, by the way, is a really important thing to understanding what options are available to you in your strategy. Um, you guys, anybody here taking a geography course? All right. Anybody here done land nav? Great. With or without a GPS? Without. 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 Huh? Good. Good. Because you know that satellite up there might disappear. But that framework was not enough. The, the other thing is he looked at what he called the great problems that sprung from the interaction of human nature doing physical work and geography. And all of those things are, are tempered in some respects by what he called objective conditions. So what are some of those great problems? Well, some of them include things like the problem of Germany I'm going to talk about today. The, 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 how about the, the, uh, the strategic condition of the United States? What is it about the United States that's different than other countries? You know, we're blessed by the fact that we're in the Western Hemisphere and not in the Eastern Hemisphere. We have a couple of ferocious countries on our border. Right? Canada, Big Threat, <laughs> Mexico. Not, not, you know, we're pretty blessed by, relatively speaking, you'd rather be here than, let's say, Poland. Okay? Or, you know, pick your country. What are uh, the, problem, the problem of Russia? Right? The problem of Russia, a country that for centuries is seeking the ability to develop uh, warm water ports, access to the sea, and to bring the enormous industrial and physical resources of its country to bear, uh, to control the area around, around its, its region and the like. So he had us focus on those big strategic problems. But at the same time, recognize that there's nothing immutable about these things. You know, the Russians and the Germans fought each other uh, a couple of times, right? World War I, World War II in the last century. But they also were allies. And so objective conditions change. And so it's important as you look at the big strategic problems, the fundamental problems, today we might say, are Russia and China friends? Well, naturally speaking, probably not. But they work together. They ally together because the objective conditions are such that it's in their interest to do so. I'll give you a real-world example that had an impact on me. I, had to do, I was Deputy National Security Advisor. <clears throat> I was in charge of overseeing um, our strategy change at the end of the Bush administration that sent a lot of your colleagues to Iraq in the surge to try to win the war against what was at the time viewed very difficult odds. Um, but one of the problems we had there was the idea of, of look, looking at Iraq and saying, you know, would an, would an essentially um, Sunni governed state, right, would they, would, would they ally themselves, or with, with, with the Syrians in particular, ally themselves with these radicals who, who, were, who were coming in to Iraq to blow up Americans, blow up Iraqis, uh, and, and the like? Logic would tell you Syria would have no interest in that. Why? Well, they tend to be a Shia-dominated state, number one. Number two, why would they want to why would they want to uh, uh, empower people like the Muslim Brotherhood in their own country who might who might uh, 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 you know provide provide them uh, some kind of insecurity in the future? But it turned out 
there was common cause between those two. Similarly, at the end of the war, there was common cause between the Americans and the Sunnis to bring the fighting to an end. So objective conditions can change the situation on the ground, and understanding what those are is really important. Dr. Rue talked a lot about freedom of action, that a strategy ought to be promoting freedom of action. In fact, it was the beginning of strategic wisdom to appreciate that uh, competing great powers are attempting constantly to organize the system to their advantage. These powers will eventually resort to war to bring about that organization, even if it's a limited war of some kind, or at least to resist the attempt of others to do so. And that the deeply rooted patterns of international politics give us important clues as to who is doing what to whom. And thus, who are the potential adversaries and allies? Um, Dr. Root had a, a line, <coughs> he would say, you know, you run the show, or the show runs you. You need to figure out what are the shows you need to run for your own country, both for its survival and for its advancement. Retaining freedom of action was the most important peacetime object then, because you didn't know what was going to happen when war came. Preparations for war were the most important human activity to study because they gave the clearest clues to intent of your adversaries. If somebody's going to spend money, do physical work, make hard choices, it's probably, in the area of, of, of armaments and the like, it's probably worth paying a lot of attention to that. The other element, I think, that is, runs through his thinking and is a problem for all of us is what he would call the democratic strategy deficit. This is certainly not to say that he didn't want to live in a democracy. It's the only place he could have lived. It's the only place he would have felt comfortable in living. But he was particularly concerned about this deficit because he lived in one of those democracies and he believed in it. And he was not sentimental about it, some of its shortcomings. And the problem, of course, is that in democracy, it's harder to conduct a strategy, isn't it? Everybody has a vote. Everybody has a voice. Those are our strengths. That's what makes us better and different than much of the world, but it also makes it more difficult to conduct strategy, particularly since we want to believe that things are political, not military, as opposed to seeing political and military things as really being reflections of one another. Um, we have enormous optimism, which we should have. It's both a strength and a weakness. Right? The international system is not like a democracy. Uh, and in the international system, power and force tend to be more dominant than in a democracy. In a democracy, we still have power, but we diffuse that power. We control it. We constrain it through our institutions, through our laws, through our constitution. And we seek compromise and accommodation. Those are inherent features. That's what we live with day to day in our country. But that's not, he would have argued, the way the international system works. So, you know, it's very, a classic example of this, I think, is 9 11. Uh, after the initial shock of 9 11, there were many people out there saying, you know, well, what did we do to deserve this? Why did they do this to us? This is so abnormal in our context, right? I think he would have argued the opposite, that no, this is actually quite normal in international politics. Same thing, by the way, when the video came out, right? You know, people, why, why, would, they, why, why would they do these things? Uh, it's because we live in an international system where there is enormous jockeying for benefit and control and power. And that democracies, unfortunately, don't like to face those things. They're hard choices. They're hard facts. 
one of the few people that he had me read, Nicholas John Spikeman, who taught up here at Yale in the 1940s, said, postponing a fight until one has been outmaneuvered is practiced only by democracies. And there's a truth to it. We want to postpone a fight. But sometimes it's not good. So let me finally uh, turn to one of those problems in international relations and give you an idea of how he would connect the dots on this, how he would take a broader view, maybe, than, than was taken by others. And that is, in this particular case, the, the problem of Germany. Um, how many people in here have done any study on World War I or World War II? Is that part of your curriculum at all in, in ROTC? Because I see that we're mostly ROTC folks here, or others. Do they even have you touch on that anymore? Can somebody tell me what the cause of World War I was? Can somebody tell me what the cause of World War II was? Okay, hands up here, I like it. There, Jimmy Campbell. Uh, for World War I, there really was no one cause. Uh, it was lots of secret treaties and secret plans on parts of all European powers. It said, what said it off of the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, which caused people, to armies to be mobilized, and it just kind of went into a domino effect, and war was going to happen. Okay. So, good. That is a perfect description <coughs> of the dominant narrative of World War I. That is to say, it's not only dominant in the history books, it's dominant in a lot of things. So. Dr. Rood uh, would have stepped back from that and said something a little different about it. Because if you think about that explanation, it focuses very much on what was happening in the moment. Right? There were these secret military pacts that were relatively new. And there was failed diplomacy. And there was the assassination of an archduke. And there were a bunch of crazy guys running around in Serbia. Well, you know, there have been a bunch of crazy guys running around in Serbia for a long time, okay. as well. It's elsewhere. I'm not picking on the Serbians. Uh, what Dr. Root would have said is, look, step back from this. He would have challenged, I think, that dominant narrative. He would have said, really, there have been larger forces at work in this problem that from roughly the time of the Reformation, until the middle of the 19th century, the politics of Central Europe was dominated by this German problem. The German lands outside the Habsburg Empire were not ruled by a single power, but by a bewildering collection of kingdoms, principalities, bishoprics, and the like. And over all these centuries, the German problem for France was very clear. keep Germany divided, right? Prevent the unification of Germany under a centralized leadership where the full power of German might could be concentrated to accomplish a purpose. And what was that purpose, if you were German? To prevent French interference in the affairs of Germany, to keep Germany unable to act on its own and on its own behalf. So one way of looking at World War I and World War II, he would have argued, is to step back and look at the development of the German problem. The successful conclusion of the war by Germany uh, at the end of World War I was, in a sense, a failure because it left French military power intact. It had to rebuild, of course. But the logic of German policy that had been driving Germany for over 100 years had been basically to dismember France. So Root would have concluded that at the outbreak of World War I was really the result of the intersection of the German problem uh, and, and what was also called the Eastern question, that is the, all the problems down in, these, in the principalities, Romania, Serbia, and the like.
but, but not a tragic result, as the conventional wisdom would have you understand it, of a system of entangling alliances that, that basically you know, drag European powers into conflict with one another uh, willy-nilly, that is to say, almost against their will. He would have looked at it in the context of the fact that Germany had sought to unify itself. She had fought four wars in the 19th century, culminating in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, in which the German army occupied Paris. And that the purpose of German policy was to secure Germany's future for, in Europe for all time and against all potential enemies. And indeed, if you jump, if you jump to uh, uh, the uh, uh, quotation in early 1917, this is September, remember the war starts in, I'm sorry, 1914, the war starts in 19, August of 1914, the then Chancellor of Germany, a guy named Bentham Holy, not known for, by the way, being some radical, crazy guy, pretty moderate, elected politician, says, the general aim of the war was security for the German Reich in the West and the East for all imaginable time. For this purpose, <clears throat> France must be so weakened as to make her revival as a great power impossible for all time. Russia must be thrust back as far as possible from Germany's eastern frontier and her domination over the non-Russian vassal peoples broke. Okay, that's pretty clear strategic guidance, isn't it? Right? If you guys were military commanders, you could take that as strategic guidance. It's interesting, first of all, it's interesting kind of how tough it is. But it's also interesting because it's World War I. And we tend not to think, we tend to think of World War I in the way of countries being sort of dragged into this conflict. Now, one of the reasons we do that is because we, you, you look at the horrific losses of World War I, and we are overcome with the sentiment of, was, could that possibly have been worth it? And that's a judgment that only you can render individually. Certainly easy to come to the conclusion that it wasn't worth it. But at the same time, what propelled Germany to undertake the war was that set, that sort of <coughs> inherent logic that Dr. Root spoke about. The need for Germany to sustain and advance its own security in the center of Europe. And the only way to do that was to lay out the, uh, the, the set of objectives that Ben from Holwig, Holwig mentioned. Uh, I'd like to quote uh, another quote, which is from a, a meeting that was held <clears throat> in Germany, I believe in, 19, in 1941. Uh, yeah, actually July 16th in 1941. And so this is a different German leader. And he says, in principle, we have now to face the task of cutting up the giant cake according to our needs in order to be able to, first, to dominate it, second, to administer it, and third, to exploit it. Well, who is this? This is Adolf Hitler, and it's July 1941. What happened in June of 1941? Hitler invaded Russia. So the German armies are spreading out over the east. And he says, never again must it be possible to create a military power west of the Urals, even if we have to wage war for a hundred years in order to attain this goal. All successors of the Fuhrer must know security for the Reich exists only if there are no foreign military forces west of the Urals. It is Germany who undertakes the protection of those areas. We must never permit anybody but the Germans to carry arms. Now that's pretty tough, <laughs> but you'd expect that from Adolf Hitler. But it's interesting that the war aims that were described, I remember, 
few months prior to this invasion, what had Germany secured? In June of 1940. The German armies smashed through Belgium, worked around the Maginot Line, encircled Paris, destroyed the French army, and cut France up into a series of vassal states. One, some administered by the Vichy government and some administered directly by the Third Reich. So what's interesting about that is that German policy, beginning in the 19th century, in the unification of Germany, extending into the First World War, in German war aims, and, 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 then, and then again after the recovery of Germany, uh, and, and of course during the Hitlerian period, is consistent across time and across a very broad cross-section of leaders. So for, for Rood, the German problem was in fact what was being, what, what we, there, there were forces larger than the simple explanation that we now see, and again, I, I, the dominant explanation, you, you, you got it exactly right, so you, 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 get, you get an A. But he would, he, would, he would have said, look, you need to step back from that and understand what the larger forces were at work. Now, does it matter that Adolf Hitler is the leader and not somebody else? Sure. Does it matter that you know, the Kaiser is inept, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, all those things matter. They, they, uh, they have an impact on the objective circumstances of the moment. But the larger forces at work were the playing out in Europe of that German problem. And indeed, you know, if you think about it, uh, the fierceness with which the Germans fought that war, uh, both wars, gave some measure of the importance of that to the survival of the German state. Uh, extraordinary measures were gone to root emphasized that German objectives after the war, after World War I, remained pretty much the same, right? German policy towards France continued despite Germany's defeat and the change of the regime. Uh, and and, it, and it, cons it was consistent throughout the whole so-called Weimar period, which was a period of, of putative democracy in Germany. And indeed, who was helping, does anybody know, who was helping the Germans secretly rearm long before Adolf Hitler? The Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. So what made those plans possible, that is to say Hitler's plans, was, the, was this secret rearmament that had been carried out from the very close of World War I and aided by the cooperation of the Soviet Union. So when the Nazis came to power, they accelerated German rearmament, mobilized the German people, and em embarked upon what they called a new order in Europe, which included the occupation and dismemberment of France. So, the German problem was not really solved, certainly for France, until 1945. And it was done so really with token support from the French. For they had in the meantime been occupied and dismembered. Germany was again divided after the war, east and west, and its regime changed, one into a democratic, one into a communist variant. The East German regime existed only with the support and sufferance of the Soviet Union, and the political system, economy, and security of the Federal Republic of Germany was deliberately interwoven so tightly into the Western alliance that it, would, it, would rep, it could not represent a threat to its neighbors uh, or reunify with the East without the acquiescence of the great powers. So, you know, the presence and it was really the presence of the United States in Europe that, that allowed that to happen. You may know this, the old saying that, you know, 
the Western alliance, known as NATO, was to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. This pattern of international politics in Europe endured over four decades. And, uh, and, it, and it didn't disappear overnight. Most of you are too young to, probably, to remember the fact that Germany was divided. You probably have read about it in history books. Uh, but, you know, it, it, bringing Germany back together was a big deal in Europe because of a concern about the recreation of the German problem. Not only did the Russians oppose it at first, but even, even West Germany's putative allies, democratic allies, the, you know, Margaret Thatcher, who was a conservative, Francois Mitterrand, who was a socialist in France, were very lukewarm on this idea. Uh, the skeptics at the time liked to quote a Frenchman, a uh, famous Frenchman, who, who said, he said, I love Germany so much that I hope there will always be two of them. <laughs> So here's a pattern in international relations. Here's something that over, over several hundred years was working itself out. That the French were resisting the unification of Germany. The, the Germans were seeking the unification of Germany. The other, other great powers were paying attention to this. Were, had, had their had their uh, their interests engaged in the region, and that above all is, in his view, a way to sort of look at problems of international relations. That narrowly thinking about well, what's going on today in Iraq without understanding several hundred years of Shia Sunni conflict is probably not the best place to drop yourself into the war without that understanding. Um, and an enormous value, I think, in, in thinking about what are the great problems of today? How do we view the rise of China against that backdrop? What does it mean for American interests in the Pacific? How do we understand the problem of Asia in terms of the relationship between a strong Japan and a strong China at the same time. Historically, a bit of an anomaly. What does it mean in terms of American presence in the region? <coughs> that problem will be one that I will explore later, but it will also be one that you guys will face in your generation. So understanding what that problem is, where it came from historically, how it's constrained geographically, how it's constrained culturally, is important to understanding what the strategists we need to do about it. So let me close and have an opportunity for some questions. Um, I, um, I will say that, as you can tell, this, this gentleman had a profound impact on my life. I hope that you have a professor or two that has a profound, or a leader that you work under who has a similar profound impact on your life. Uh, I had the pleasure of, uh, of spending many days with him, and I also, uh, you know, went out to San Francisco to see him, see him uh, laid to rest. But I, ha I couldn't help thinking at the time that I was doing that that somehow a watchtower had fallen. Because this is a guy who could see what was going on in the world and give you some insights into what it meant. But then I realized that, and it's one of the reasons I embarked on this lecture, that we're all watchtowers. We all have the potential, as he would say, to see things as they are and to develop strategies that advance the interests of our country. And it's our obligation, not only in my case to him, but in your case to your country, to do exactly that. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'm, I'm open to questions. Particularly, I'm open to questions also on things that necessarily I didn't touch on in the lecture, because I recognize that many of you probably have not read anything by Dr. Rood. So if you'd like to delve into more current events, 
I'm happy to respond to questions about that as well. Thank you very much. signals early and uh, you know one of the problems of course is in international relations is these objective conditions and the objective circumstance there was the Russians had an army and air power on the border and what they were attempting to do was uh, I mean under the guise of protecting a Russian minority they were attempting to demonstrate the folly of trying to bring Georgia into NATO. And so it's a tough question. Uh, I think there were ways in which we could have supported Georgia to make the lesson learned out of that uh, better, not only for Georgia, but for ourselves. Uh, but the reality is we didn't have a lot of capability in the region to do that. And I'm not suggesting that you know we needed to get anywhere near to going to war with Russia over Georgia. That's not the issue. I think the, the question was, we, we seem to be, high, and my recollection of it is we seem to be rather ambivalent in the way we approached it. Yet, prior to that, we had made some pretty strong noises about our support for Georgia. So, you know, another lesson perhaps from that is, you know, be careful uh, that you don't let your rhetoric get out in front of your capability. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Shivan Scordino. Um, during election season, one of the candidates labeled Russia as America's number one geopolitical foe. Do you think that was an accurate assess assessment of Russia and a uh, good use of the, of the term geopolitical foe? And a good use of the term geopolitical foe, you said? Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, I would say, well, I would start with the following observation. That I think the Russians, well, the Russians, I think the Russian government views us as their number one geopolitical foe. I don't think that means that they are ours. Um, but I was struck in, you know, prior to being U.S. Ambassador to Romania, I was Assistant Secretary of Defense. And one of the things I had to do in that was, was in fact, working with Professor, or uh, Dr. Cambone up there, uh, was to work on a new nuclear posture review. And this was a, a review of all of our nuclear weapons posture, you know, how many weapons, what's their purpose, et cetera, et cetera. So we finished this big review, and one of the first countries that we invited to brief on this was, oddly enough, the Russian Federation. <clears throat> and members of the Russian uh, uh, general staff came over. We sat down and we walked them through, not the classified aspects of this, but the, basically the policy. What were we trying to get at? And, and one of the points we made was, we're no longer sizing our nuclear force as Russia is our opponent. And you would think, a reaction to that would be, uh, well, that's good, <laughs> you know, if you're Russia. They were insulted. <laughs> and I was a little taken aback. I have to say, I didn't anticipate that reaction. They were insulted because they were saying, you don't take us seriously anymore. We are your biggest geopolitical foe. Um, so, I, I am not sure that I would accept uh, the, the statement of whoever said that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, I assume it was probably not President uh, Obama. Um, uh, 
because from from a material standpoint, you know, Russia has obviously degraded enormously. But it is important to understand that they tend to view NATO and the West um, as their principal foe. And this, by the way, Dr. Rood would have had a lot to say on, because he would have said this is really the playing out of the of, of the Russia problem. That it was not only Russia trying to gain freedom of action, but Russia historically seeing itself as an alternative to Western Christendom. Have you ever heard of the idea of the Third Rome? Right? That Moscow is the Third Rome. A separate center of uh, cultural power, distinct from Western Europe, and certainly distinct from the United States. The United States, in fact, is somewhat ancillary to all this. We're the, we're the proverbial uh, rock in the way. The interests of Russia, he would argue, were in dominating the Eurasian landmass. And to do that, you had to, you had to negate the power of the United States. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's uh, a point of view. Sir? Uh, yeah, is there, uh, just back uh, earlier in your lecture, you were talking about uh, you know, the, the large picture of uh, you know, Germany you know, attempting to expand itself in France and Western Europe, maybe more trying to hold Germany down. Uh, in that context, you know, I've, in other classes, uh, history and uh, international relations, they talk about the appeasement by Western Europe to Germany, which allowed them to rise back to power. Uh, so how does that play into, uh, you know, if Western Europe was attempting to keep them down to prevent them from rising to power, where does, how does that play into their strategy? Why would that, you know, how, why would that happen? Mm -hmm. how, how, why, why, would, why would they attempt to, why, why would France attempt to appease uh, Germany, is that the question? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, you know, historically the French were rather reluctant appeasers. All right, the appeasement was actually being promoted more by the British than it was by the French. Uh, but, but also there were material conditions why the French wanted to appease the Germans. Let's, let's not forget what happened at the end of the First World War, because first of all, uh, you know, two major empires collapsed. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, well, three arguably, and the, and the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. One of them reformed itself into the Soviet Union over the 20s. But more importantly, France and Britain were tired. They were, they had, they had expended an enormous amount of blood and treasure in the First World War. And there was not a lot of interest in confronting that reality. And so I mentioned the secret rearmament. It's important to recognize is that it was really only secret, in fact, to most of the, you know, some of the public. I mean, German rearmament was something that was kind of known about in the 20s. And it was you know, it was dismissed as, well, you know, we can't do anything about it, or we're not willing to do anything about it. Uh, I don't suggest you do this, but if you went back and looked at the reports of the commission that were set up to monitor Germany after the war to make sure that they didn't rearm, you will see example after example of the people doing that, kind of like Saddam Hussein and the IAEA, right? Uh, sending reports and saying, I think they're rearming, <laughs> you know? So it was known long before Adolf Hitler that the Germans had begun that rearmament program. And it was known that they were being supported by the Soviet Union. But remember I said that democracies really practice the strategy of postponing a fight until they've been outmaneuvered. Nobody in France and Britain, and, and there were, look, there were objective economic conditions in particular that, that put enormous strain you know, on, on, on the actors in this case. 
the, uh, you know, Hitler had the advantage after 1933 of knowing exactly what he wanted to do and of organizing the country to get it done. He wanted to destroy the power of France, weaken and isolate Britain, destroy the Soviet Union, create a living area in the East, and, and create a German Reich that would last a thousand years. Yeah, it's ambitious, <laughs> but he knew what he wanted to do. He had the advantage of knowing what he wanted to do. The British were trying to figure out how they were going to continue to support their empire, how they were going to pay for stuff. They wanted, they wanted a cheap way out. Appeasement was a cheap way out, particularly if what you were appeasing with wasn't your territory. It wasn't so cheap if you were Czech. It wasn't so cheap if you were Poles. But after all, you know, if you avoid a war, isn't that a good thing? In the end, what they got was neither an avoidance of war, uh, or did they save any money. So, you know, I think, you know, appeasement to some degree, appeasement, by the way, in my view, is not always the wrong thing in internet. You have to make a calculation. If somebody is actually appeasable, it may be the right thing to do if it avoids conflict. It's always understanding when is it the right thing to do. I hope that helps yes, you. your understanding. Dr. Crouch, tell me about, um, if you would, um, a little bit about these weapons of mass destruction. It's generally agreed today that there aren't any, that there weren't any, I should say, in Iraq. But the one thing that, if you're a fan of murder mysteries, you'll know is that you can't prove a negative. Um, what's the probability that there actually were uh, some weapons of mass destruction and we weren't able to find them, for example, biological and uh, chemical uh, weapons that um, don't take up very much um, space? Yeah. All right, so um, we talked about this a little bit at lunch, uh, and you know, the, so one of the narratives that came out of the Iraq, the recent Iraq war, the bumper sticker, right, you all seen it, Bush lied, people died. What did he lie about? He lied about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. <clears throat> Every intelligence agency in the Western world believed there were West, believed there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The IAEA believed they were building or, or attempting to build nuclear weapons. The UN you know, did, what, 17, 18 resolutions condemning Hassan Hussein in the country of Iraq. Why? Because of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, so I really think that that narrative is just fundamentally wrong in the sense that nobody lies. But maybe somebody was wrong. Um, so if you look at the post-war reports that were written on this, where they went in and interviewed Iraqis, uh, looked at sites and the like, what you'll see is a, a clear statement that, that it looked like he was trying to preserve the ability to reconstitute weapons of mass destruction, but that they did, he didn't have stockpiles of it. And, it turns out that the nature of those weapons, particularly chemical and biological, not so much nuclear, doesn't really require you to have stockpiles sitting around. I mean, they can be created pretty easily, pretty quickly. You can convert a fertilizer factory to chemical <laughs> weapons. Uh, most of you probably have all you need to create a biological weapon except the initial specimen in your kitchen. You know, good refrigerator, good test tubes, and the like. Now, that's not a weapon per se, but the know-how behind that, the ability to, to, to weaponize that was something that they still had, and it was, and the scientists they had confirmed that we viewed our role as preserving that capability. Now, why would Iraq want to do that? Well, we, again, talked about it at lunch. Iraq had an interest in deterring Iran. They had an interest in deterring the United States, and they had an interest in being viewed as an important, powerful country in the region. All of which might lead you to think weapons of mass destruction would be a good thing to have. Or at least to be able to have other people think you had. 
Now, I know there are conspiracy, there, conspiracy theories, that maybe that's the right word. There are arguments out there that maybe some of these things found their way out, out of Iraq. Uh, some people have argued that they came out through Syria. Um, remember, in the first Gulf War, uh, oddly enough, Saddam Hussein flew his entire air force to Iran. He never got it back. <laughs> so. But I can't, I can't speak to the veracity of those particular things. I think in the end, what it probably was, was the fact that our, our intelligence uh, was so caught up in a, a, a kind of a narrative, if you will, about how they would create nuclear weapons, it's, it's, or how they would create weapons of mass destruction, that we expected to find stockpiles there. Uh, Why didn't they create them if you don't think they did? Because they didn't need to. If they needed them, they would have created them. Certainly in the chemical and biological area. You know, it's interesting, if you go back before the first Persian Gulf War, there was also a narrative the narrative was Saddam Hussein is not trying to build a nuclear weapon. That was what our intelligence community said. And the reason we did that is we were looking for how we would build a nuclear weapon in Iraq. And we saw no evidence in Iraq of how we would build a nuclear weapon. When we got in there, we found out that he, was, he, he did, in fact, have a nuclear weapons program. It's one of the reasons why people were rather shocked post-war, uh, Persian Gulf War intelligence. But he had taken different courses. There are different ways to do it. We looked at it through the prism of how would we do it today. He was looking at it through the prism of how the heck can I get these things as fast as I can. And he had actually gone back to some techniques that we used in the Manhattan Project that we, would, we have since long abandoned. So it's very easy to get in the intelligence world, as in the military world or the business world or whatever, to get into group them. Uh, this is how they would do it and, 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 and not step back and say, well, there may be other ways to do it. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that there's been some Well, the, the, the anomaly is, is that, it, 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 I mean, I, maybe that's a little too strong, but, but typically if you, if you look back over, over the last uh, few hundred years, you, you've either had a very strong China that has tended to dominate the Korean Peninsula and from there dominate Japan, or you've had a strong Japan that has dominated the Korean Peninsula and thereby dominated China. Um, and uh, obviously, the most recent manifestations of this were at <clears throat> the end of the 19th century uh, in the defeat, the defeat of the Chinese in the, in the Sino-Japanese War, the subsequent then defeat by the Japanese of the Russians in the Sino-Russian, or the Japanese-Russian War, uh, and, and the sort of creation of a, of a Japan that was dominant in the East until, until, uh, uh, until the arrival of the United States Marine Corps. Okay. So that, uh, that problem uh, worked itself out in that way. Uh, and post-war, you had a, uh, a China that was unifying, but that was not really powerful or wealthy. Today, you have a Japan that is powerful and wealthy, although they're Power is not so much based on military power, although don't kid yourself that they couldn't become a first-rate nuclear weapons power very quickly if they wanted to. Uh, and they could also generate a lot of other military capability if they wanted to. Uh, over and against a, a, a rising China, where China is now seeking, I think, the problem, the problem of Asia today will be how, how, do you, how do you manage the rise of China? What role does the United States play 
in securing uh, freedom of action in Asia, uh, trade in Asia, and the like, uh, and, and securing what, are, what we, we call the sort of island countries around the periphery uh, uh, of China. One does not imagine, it's very hard to imagine U.S. military power, you know, in China. That's, that's not impossible, but it's unlikely. But how we manage the rise of China and the impact that that rise has on countries that have traditionally, in the post-war period, been allied with the United States, will, will determine to a large degree what influence we have in the region in the future. And so that's really the problem. Uh, and the, the, spe the specific problem I mentioned was also, we also have to manage our own allies to a certain degree. Because we want, a, we want a Japan that is secure enough in its own position that it, it aligns its interests and its actions to the degree possible with the United States' interests and actions. But, if it looks like to Japan that we're not there to protect them, you could very easily see how Japan might veer off in a different direction. So, you know, there's a, there's a real debate right now inside the Japanese polity about should they become a nuclear weapons state. That's really the first time that debate has kind of cropped out in public. It's always been under the surface. The why it popped out in public. <clears throat> and I think a lot of what's impelling that in a discussion is a combination of a sense of American withdrawal from the region and the rise of, of, a, of a more threatening China. Is that? Before we thank Dr. Crouch, um, I want to reemphasize um, our gratitude to Dr. Patrick Garrity who organized this whole series of lectures that Dr. Krauss will be giving this year. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Garrity, who's of the uh, Miller Center at University of Virginia, will be organizing the lectures for next year and the year after, which we'll also be participating in. Uh, Dr. Kim Bone will be giving them the year after next, and Dr. Chris Harmon um, of Quantico will be here next year for these lectures. I also want to give uh, special thanks to Colonel Marchiori for um, working so kindly with me to organize this so that we could um, bring Dr. Crouch's wisdom uh, to Villanova and, and um, uh, invite all of you from ROTC. And also Lieutenant uh, Brian Poulter, whom, whom I had the uh, good fortune to have in, in class last year, and he was instrumental in, in putting all this together. Just one note on Dr. Rue, one of the things I remember particularly about him, when you would go to his office, well, first of all, you could barely fit in there because books were everywhere. And um, in those days, some people smoked and he'd blow the smoke away and he'd put the cigarette out immediately because he never smoked around people. He smoked in private. And somehow in the midst of all this, in the corner was stuffed this army cot that when he would come down to Claremont, he would travel down um, from Northern California, come down for how many days a week, maybe? Three. And he would, I think he slept, I think he slept on his, in his office on the army cot because he, he didn't think he needed anything else because the entire rest of the time he was at Claremont, he spent his time with students. Uh, he just devoted himself to his students, partly I think for love of them, but partly for love of country because um, the kinds of activities that you're engaged in are the most critical because the most necessary, right? to the future of our country. You know, you, you folks are the only people I know here at Villanova who actually get up about five o'clock. <laughs> um, and maybe the only ones who are sure of a job when you graduate. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, I'm very happy to work with ROTC here at Villanova, and I appreciate the hard work that you're doing here and will do for us. Um, please join me in, in um, uh, thanking Dr. Crouch for his willingness to take time out of an incredibly busy schedule and be with us here this